Let me start this lecture with pulling you right away into the context of the topic that we are going to discuss this evening. And um, what we are going to discuss this evening is about affordability of drugs. And this, of course, is linked to pricing of drugs. And pricing of drugs has become a very sensitive issue over the past year, maybe years. And if I show you a slide that illustrates that context, then it's this one. It shows the number of, uh, not the number, but a number of uh, representative comments that were made in the Wall Street Journal, in Fortune, by Margaret Chen, the Director General of the World Health Organization, the New York Times, the Irish Times, and all of them argue we have a major problem with pricing of drugs. This is a situation that is difficult to sustain, and you will see later on that this is in fact the case. But I'm going to take you through a number. First of all, I'm going to take you through a very short case because this is a business school and a business school is all around cases. So I'm going to give you one short slide with a case study just to put you in the mood, okay? So the case is about a certain individual, Mr. Weissman. And Mr. Weissman was uh, at one point, he, re he woke up in the morning and he had a slide fresh. And he said, well, this is not a big problem. I'm going to treat this with anti-allergic uh, drugs and it, it will be gone soon. But the point was that Mr. Weissman was uh, diagnosed with uh, T-cell lymphoma, which is a serious cancer. So Mr. Weissman was treated with a number of drugs and still a number of other drugs. And at one point, he came into financial problems. And in fact, Mr. Weissman, who was a long-term employee of a big firm, actually had to fall back on charity in order to be able to be treated. This on itself is a serious case. This is not only in Tampa, Florida. This has been the case for many, many years in Africa, for many, many years in India. This is becoming the case in countries such as Belgium, where I'm coming from. So we have a problem with pricing of drugs. And this is why, and let me return to the first, the introductory slide, so to speak, which reads biotherapeutics, the cost that may prevent us to return to health. And I know this is a, a striking statement. I know it's a bit stretched, but then I think we are not far from that situation, from that context. Okay, so let me go through this, go beyond this case, and let's talk about biotherapeutics. What is so peculiar about biotherapeutics? Biotherapeutics constitute a public good. Okay. It is a product that prevents epidemics and treats people so that they return to health so that they can become operational in society and drive or work together in, in an economic system. So it's a public good. But on top of that, a biotherapeutic also has a, carries a moral weight that most privately, privately owned goods do not have. I don't know whether you have heard the interview from that CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals who was challenged because of the 7,000 increase in, in over overnight increase in price for the drugs for treat HIV. And when they interviewed Mr. Schriekel, I don't know whether I pronounce his name correctly, he said, well, if I'm, if I'm building an Aston Martin, I'm not going to sell it for the price of a Toyota. But he's missing the point. He's missing the point because a biotherapeutic carries with it a moral weight that most privately goods do not have, do not have. and for there is a widespread belief that people have the right to health. They do not necessarily have the right to own an Aston Martin, but they have the right to health. So every biotherapeutic on itself carries a moral weight. On top of that, and those in this uh, lecture room who work in the industry knows that the development of a drug costs an enormous amount of money. And figures range from very minimalistic 100 million euros up to $5 billion. And the question, of course, is where is the actual number? Anyway, one thing is sure, it costs a lot of money. And because it costs a lot of money, and because these companies want to recover their investment, drugs increase in price. At the same time, these companies work in an Anglo-Saxon free market capitalistic society, which means that the purpose is to maximize their profit. You cannot blame them for maximizing their profit. 
And the last point is, this is only the beginning. We are talking about precision medicines. We're not yet talking about personalized medicine. Personalized medicine is very different from precision medicine. Our medicine has become more precise. Our drugs have become more precise to treat people. But this is far from personalized medicine. But if precision medicine, which is actually what biotherapeutics do, they actually lead to more precise medicine. If this is going to develop in personalized medicine, a drug for you and for you and still another for you, then of course this is going to increase price even more. So it means we need to think about cost of development, pricing of drugs. Okay? Let me take you through some facts, just again to set the scene. All right? The facts. What you see here is a graph with, in the x-axis, the number of addressable patients, okay? In the x-axis you see a number which is ranging from 2,000, I think this should be 2,000 up to 18,000, up to 150,000, which is, in fact, the number of patients that can be addressed and can be considered uh, orphan patients, orphan diseases for which orphan drugs should be developed. And the development of an orphan drug costs as much as the development of a non-orphan drug, which means that if you need to recover all the costs for an, for, for an orphan drug, then obviously price increase. And this is what is showing this curve. For all these orphan drugs, the price goes up to an, an annual cost per patient up to 550,000 euros, dollars, excuse me, up to 1,400,000 for one single treatment of Glibera, which is gene therapy. You understand, these are incredible figures. Now you could argue that, this is only part of the story, you could argue that if this is the case, then if the drug is not an orphan disease, or not an orphan drug, it can be treated for a large number of people, then prices will drop dramatically and come to a level that would accept, be acceptable for each of us. Now if, that's, if you look to the data, then you see that in fact, for big markets, such as 3 million patients, which is a quite large market, okay, prices drop, but they drop up to a level which is still up to the 50 to 100,000 cost, annual cost in dollars. Okay. So in fact, the, the, the price does not drop to, let's say, a fraction of a monthly income. The price is high, even for those um, uh, uh, group of patients which are not considered um, orphan patients, okay? This is the curve specifically for cancer drugs, okay? And this was developed by Peter Bach at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And he shows, this is a logarithmic y-axis, and it shows the price, the monthly and median cost of cancer drugs at the time of FDA approval from 1965 to this year, okay? And this is an exponential curve, so the increase is almost exponential, even more. Now you could argue, and this would be a good argument, you could argue that specifically this drug is much more efficient than this drug. But that is not necessarily the case. So you cannot differentiate these prices and say this drug is much more efficient than the other drug. There may be other reasons. Maybe the manufacturing cost was extremely high for this specific drug. But anyway, the fact is, the absolute figures show <laughs> that we are dealing with extreme prices, okay, up to the 100,000 annual cost. This shows, in fact, the same, this blue graph shows is the same picture, so to speak, as what was shown on the previous slide. But the green one is quite important. It shows that the cost to gain one year of life based on drug prices in 2014 dollars increased from well, about 2,000 euro, for, excuse me, from about 54,000 euros up to 224, in some cases 300,000 euros increase. Okay, so the cost, that the, the, the amount of money that it needs in order to gain one additional year of high quality, of good quality life is 224,000 euros you could, or one could argue and explain or give a number of reasons why this is the case, but we are focusing now on the specific fact that these prices are there. They face us, they look to us right in our face, okay? 
This is a picture from Belgium in which this is the amount of money that is being reimbursed for drugs but not precision medicine. And then it shows you, it, it shows that in 2005 there was an amount of precision medicine reimbursed and then that quadrupled in, by 2013 by four times, fourfold increase. Now, if this is only for oncology drug, you can imagine what is going to happen. If this is going to take place for multiple sclerosis, for diabetes, for all the other diseases for, for which precision medicines are being developed today. So it means that, again, we are facing not only the patients, because this, in fact, is a picture that was presented by the Ministry of Health on a health conference last week in Brussels. It not only addresses patients, it also addressed governments. Okay? So there is a huge problem, not only for the patients and for communities, there's also a huge problem for governments and for the amount of money that will remain available for treatment of disease. In fact, if you read the most negative papers on this topic, they will say that at one point you will need to choose whether you will need, you, you will need want a healthy community or you want a community that can make use of uh, free uh, university and whatever, and free education. You know, at one point you will need to choose, okay? So why do prices increase? Well, there are a number of reasons. Increased R&D cost, precision medicine, orphanization, and this is what is called orphanization because if this would be a group of patients and I could divide this group in different subgroups because that would be more precise medicine, then of course each of this group will need its own drug, it will need development and the development cost would be the same but I would like to recover my money from investment from this group and from that group. Okay, that is precision medicine. So precision medicine increases R&D cost, increased regulatory pressure, the classical um, uh, comment, the increased need for clear value. So the ideas about the Me Too drugs and the Me Better drugs will be gone within a couple of years. Increased selection risk and opportunity cost during discovery, increased outsour outsourcing of basic drug discovery. So therefore, Price reflects the risk and cost of development and the cost of manufacture. And therefore, price reflects the added, or should reflect the added value of the new biotherapeutic. But it also reflects monopoly pricing. Because specifically in the States, in the United States, you put a price on a drug because there is a patent. And there's nobody who's going to argue this is too high. Well, at, this, at, at these times, they do. But for many years, nobody argued about the price. Okay. It means that the status quo is unsustainable. We cannot go on as is. We need to do something about it. The status quo is unsustainable. So it is unsustainable for patients because at one time health expenses may absorb important fractions of family income if the trend continues and it may lead to poverty which is actually the case today in Belgium. People who are treated for cancer are in risk, in risk of returning to poverty or falling in poverty. It is not good news for governments because gov governments will need to decide can we bear the costs of drug treatment on ourselves? And I said last week when I went, was in Brussels for the health conference, the Minister of, of Health and Social Affairs in Brussels argued, well, if this is what is coming to me, then I will need to reach out to the Dutch government and to the Luxembourg government because on my own I will not be able to govern this amount of money, manage this amount of money. I will not, it will not be possible. It is also not good for the industry. I don't know whether you, you realize, but there has been a study on the reputation of the industry. And you all know Merck, the big pharma company. Merck was considered one of the most respectable companies in the States. At this time, pharma companies have a reputation if that the perception in the general public have a reputation that is the same as that of tobacco companies, which is not really good, really good, isn't it? So it's not also good for the industry. And it's not good for the world's population in general, because what actually what is happening is that people in Africa and India have been struggling to get their drugs made available. Step by step, we start struggling to have our drugs available too. So it's, a globe, it's becoming a global problem. So there are two fundamental questions, and that is in fact the reason why I invited Tom Pocker from Yale University and Tom Donaldson from the Wharton School of Business. Now the first question is, and I will introduce both speakers right away, the two fundamental questions is, are there alternative ways, because 
by the way, we are not going to talk about health economics. They're not going to talk about health economics and cost benefit and managed uh, entry agreements between industry and government. That is not what they are going to talk about. They are going to talk about first, are there alternative ways to keep innovation in the pharmaceutical industry at a very high level? But are there other ways to reward the pharmaceutical industry and the biotech industry for their innovation? That's the first question. So is there a way to think radically different from changing from, I need a drug, I'm going to pay for the drug at the current price, to a situation where I need a drug, I'm going to pay the drug at, let's say, some cost, very low, but the company will definitely be rewarded for its research because the worst thing you could do is skill innovation, okay? Because then we don't have the good drugs available. So that's the first question. Can we think about novel ways of rewarding drug firms for their innovation? And the second question is a more fundamental question. And that is, for years, people have, and especially management scholars, have been thinking in terms of theories of the firm. Now the question is, with all these theories of the firm, shouldn't we actually think in terms of theories of the business? Why are we in a certain business? What is the purpose of this business? So in fact, the two questions, because this is a serious problem, are almost philosophical questions. Okay? So the, the, the two scholars and the two academics that I would like to introduce to you now, first is um, Tom, uh, Thomas Pago, who is uh, the Leiner Professor of um, um, justice and international affairs at Yale University and he has developed a system that will turn the whole world with respect to rewards of pharmaceutical firms upside down. I have followed Thomas Pogge over the past years and I have become more and more fascinated and more and more let's say convinced that this way of approaching a reward to pharmaceutical firms, firms and making drugs more available is an absolutely good way to do, a good way to approach it. And then I'm going to leave a word to Thomas Donaldson, Tom Donaldson of the Wharton School, and he's going to address what is the business of biotech all about. And the reason why I invited Tom is very simple. Tom was here about a month or so ago and Tom had a, had a lecture here in the business school about a theory of the business. And I attended that meeting, and when I left that meeting, I was reflecting on what Tom said, and said, well, this is actually what we have been waiting for. This is what we need, a theory of the business, to reflect on what the business in fact is. Not about a firm, we have sufficient theories of the firm, but what is the business? What are we doing with this type of business? Okay. So, I'm going to leave the floor to Thomas now, and what I would like to inform you about is the following, some structure for this, uh, for, this, uh, for this lecture. So what I would like you to ask is that while Thomas and Tom are delivering their lecture, I would like you, if you have questions, to write your questions down, and then because after Tom's lecture we have uh, a 30-minute Q&A session, and then we can, you can throw all the questions that you have or written down all to us, and I will moderate the evening from that moment on, okay? That will take about 30 minutes, so t first of all, 20 to 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes for Thomas, then 25, 30 minutes for Tom, and then about 30 minutes um, Q&A session, and after that, we, the business school offers you a reception and a drink, and then we can further discuss, discuss and connect. Okay, Thomas? <laughs> so,